You're welcome. Thank you so much for attending today. We're really excited to learn from the famous Mo Carrick, which I know a lot of you know her and have taken um, classes from her before uh, or worked with her. And if you've been lucky enough, I'm sure you know just how wonderful she is. I'm really excited for today. Um, just wanted to give a quick shout out to Bend Broadband. They are actually the sponsor for our expert webinar series. Um, and we have a few more coming up, so make sure to check out our website, um, BendYP. Um, and we'll put, we'll put links in the chat for you so that you can see um, what's coming up. But Bend Broadband is actually doing a giveaway. Um, and it's really exciting because it's a $100 gift card for this group. Um, that's attending right now um, with Mo, and it's going to be to a local um, place. So go check that out. It's uh, a really great opportunity. Um, that's a good, that's a good chunk towards you know also helping out the local community. So we're really excited. I'm not going to talk very much more because um, you're not here to hear from me. We're here to hear from Miss Mo. So. Um, if you all can just hang with me here, we're going to transfer over to her. She's getting a few things set up. Um, and let me know if you have any questions about what I announced. Um, and go ahead and you can throw it in the chat. Okay, thanks so much. Welcome, Mo. Sorry, she just says one minute. She's working on a technical thing. Oh, we can't hear you, so sorry, Mo. One minute. <laughs> uh, while you guys are waiting, you're welcome to go check out um, the Bend Broadband channel or um, feel free to check out our, I'm gonna put in another link here. And I'm checking now. Yay, Yay now we can job. hear you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Well, welcome, Mo. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you so much, Addie. Hi, everybody out there. Um, good to, to have you on. And it's kind of a rainy day here. Let me just make this um, there. Hopefully, you guys can see my screen now. Um, so we have, uh, because we're webinar format, we don't have um, breakout rooms available, which was um, something that I was thinking we might be able to do in the future, but we do have the chat available. And so I would love to, because I know, I think we have quite a few people on the line and the topic today, which I'm sure you're all interested in hearing more about, I know it's something I've been thinking a lot about, is how do we maintain and nurture relationships without being face-to-face? -face? And, um, you know, this is easier, easier said than done for some reasons, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute. And actually, I'm going to probably stop sharing my screen in a second to just talk about this and we'll come back to the screen. But I would love to hear, I would love to notice in the chat um, or in the Q&A, either one, we're monitoring both. If you have any particular questions that you want me to address today or um, anything that is of particular concern to you about how we connect um, without being in person, do feel free to, um, to, to put a question up or to chat. And in, and in particular, while I'm kind of open opening us up to this subject. I'm curious about if you have, if you could weigh in on the chat with any of your experiences with connecting virtually so far. You know, we've been at this quarantine thing for um, quite a while and uh, it's challenging, you know, for all of us. And I'm, I'm just really curious. I'd love to hear via the chat, you know, what are you seeing? What are you noticing? Um, and and, and I'll be prepared, you know, to respond to some of those. So, um, so keep them coming. I'm just going to let them sort of roll for, for a few minutes um, as we kind of get warmed up to the topic. One of the things that is really powerful and that I'm hearing everywhere that I am in talking to folks um, is that, you know, it's, people are, people are feeling um, in some ways, we have this paradox going on right now because in some ways we're feeling more connected than ever. And in some ways we're feeling really, really disconnected. And now that we, we begin to open things up as business begins to, um, to enliven again, we're noticing people being out there. We've also still got a lot of fear about what does connecting actually look like um, to us and, and how are we gonna do it in these phase approaches. So 
whatever it is that you're feeling is real the ambiguity of this and it's almost harder now i think in a lot of ways in terms of how do we connect virtually and in person as we enter this transition period which is going to be lengthy as most of you know because covid will be likely to return and so businesses are opening in a phased approach and we're going to probably still be practicing a lot of quarantine practices i think for quite a long time whether it's wearing masks at work um, meeting in only small groups not large groups or even continuing to work remotely whenever we can i think that that's my personal experience is that that's probably going to continue for quite some time some of the things i'm seeing in the chat are um, that phone and online feel more draining and less deep than in-person connection um, one or two people connect is a lot better than four plus I, I would agree with that um, and having a leader uh, you know or an outline sort of helps things move along um, people are talking about somebody mentioned about variety oh not always only calling the same people um, and then you know people like making plans to connect on FaceTime or or zoom and then forgetting them um, I love the I love what Cindy just said around the subtext of relationships is in listening. What's my experience of, you know, the plus or minuses of Zoom meetings versus good old fashioned phone. And, and let me address that for a minute because we are noticing Zoom fatigue, right? You've probably seen some research about this um, or some articles about it. We do, we are, there is this phenomenon right now that we're calling Zoom fatigue and some people that are um, better researchers than I are, have been talking about kind of what does this mean, this Zoom fatigue dynamic. And um, one speculation is that it's just related to screen time, just like, you know, being on the television or being on video games has a, a, a kind of a fatiguing impact on us in terms of screen time. That's one theory about why Zoom fatigue is a real thing. I mean, what people are saying is, and you might be feeling this, you get through the day, you're on maybe four, five, eight Zoom calls during the day. And then at the end of the day, you're just exhausted. And people are kind of like, why am I so exhausted? Is it the stress of COVID? Is it, you know, what is it? It feels more tiring. Um, and if that's true for you, weigh in on the chat, but it's definitely something that I'm hearing. My, here's my theory about it. My theory about Zoom fatigue is that we are efforting for real connection. We're efforting for what I call limbic brain connection or authentic emotional connection. And we're actually efforting into the Zoom screen. Like I'm probably doing it with you right now so that I can, you can feel me and I can feel you, you know, but the reality is we can't actually connect our limbic brains, our emotional resonance, we can't connect via the screen because that happens in with our pheromones. That happens with our actual body and our brain and our emotions connecting to one another. And so even though we're efforting really hard on Zoom, I, it doesn't actually, it doesn't feel as fulfilling to us as in person. And I think personally, that's one of the reasons why we feel so tired and why we're having this Zoom fatigue. I love what Natalie just said too on the chat, if you're watching, which is that when everyone's muted, like now, right, on, on a webinar format like this, we can't hear laughter and important sounds. We also can't see and connect to like the volume of people that are on this call. We can't see the nuance of like, oh, you know, Jack's over there rolling his eyes and Natalie just took a big sigh. You know, all of that as human beings, we're very hardwired for connection. So when we're in the room with each other, we get that and it causes us to have a counter reaction, right? So if Jack rolls his eyes and I'm the speaker, I might be like, oh, I wonder what's going on with Jack. Maybe I need to engage him differently or I'm going to respond to that, not even consciously. Okay, but in a kind of an unconscious way. So the, the virtual formats that we have, as good as they are, and I think they are better than nothing, they are limited in some ways. They're limited in terms of emotional intelligence and how we can connect on a limbic brain response basis. They are also limited in terms of the, uh, the very real body language and other kinds of cueing, eye contact and language that usually we use as sources of data to impact our counter response. So, so where does that leave us, right? How do we, how do we have these relationships um, be, be fulfilling uh, even via these formats? And let me just address the issue of phone versus Zoom. So I think with phone, just being on the phone with people is a, is a technology and a mechanism of connecting that we've used for most of us for all of our lifetimes, right? And so point A. Point B, with the phone, we don't have all that efforting that's going on of trying to connect via the visual platform. 
So I think we kind of can let go of that efforting and it's a little bit less fatiguing. So I actually really love that question because I think that we could at times do a, do a service to ourselves and others by saying, hey, maybe we should just connect on the phone instead of bothering for Zoom, especially one-on-one. -on -one. Like if it's somebody that we used to connect on the phone with, maybe we just connect on the phone with them now instead of forcing that we now connect with Zoom. Because again, with Zoom, we're, we may at times be over-efforting to create that limbic brain response. So I think there's a really good case and a, and a situation where it may make sense to have phone. The other thing about the phone is that people can't mute. I was just on the phone last evening with my son who lives out of, out of the area and he was multitasking while we were talking. I heard him like moving some pieces of metal, you know, or whatever. And, um, and then his partner came in and she was chatting to him a little bit. And then I could hear the dog bark and all of those things sort of have a way of conveying the dimensions of someone that are more robust than just that silence that we get when we hit mute. And I think it humanizes us a little bit on the phone because we aren't as inclined to hit mute, although you can hit mute now on a smartphone, but in the olden days and with a regular phone, right, we didn't really have mute. Um, but I think there's something to that nuanced connection that we get um, via the phone. We can hear other sounds or just a sigh, you know, that might go on. So what I want to look at a little bit today is, okay, so we've got video, we've got phone. What are some things that we can do that will enliven our relationships um, a bit more powerfully in this time of quarantine and in these um, distancing conversations, which will likely be continuing um, for, for, for some time um, in some capacity. So keep the questions coming, keep the comments coming in the chat. I am monitoring it and I wanna address them you know, when they come up, but I do wanna go back to my slide deck and show you just a couple of things um, that will help us get grounded. And you know, how do we do this? How do we do this virtual connection uh, piece? So some of you that have been on sessions with me before, you know that I'm all, all keen about this language of what I call a brave space workplace, which is one where people can show up as they are, both perfect and flawed and do great things together. A brave space workplace activates, enlivens, and tenderly supports the complex humans that we are so that we can bring all of ourselves to work every day. And I wanted to show this definition again because I want to remind you that workplace anymore does not only include your physical location because we aren't actually co-located anymore, are we? So workplace is used much more broadly in the context that I'm using it around our work relationships. The context of our work now is more expansive to multiple locations. So Brave Space Workplace includes the interactions I'm having with people at home or in their co-working space or potentially in their office or in their school uh, where they're actually working. But the, the essence of what it takes to work well together is still the same. We need to be able to show up as we are. We need to be able to bring ourselves with all our skills and strengths and also our weaknesses. The more that happens, the more we are activated fully as a human being, the more we can contribute, which means the better the results of our organization will be. The better results we'll get, the more we'll be able to enact and implement our mission, et cetera. So the same behaviors, the same underpinnings for leaders and teams that help create a brave space workplace when we're physically co-located remain in place when we're not physically co-located. And it's important for us to keep in mind those basic dimensions of how we connect when we are in the same space to leverage them for when we're not. And let me also remind you that I'm not talking so much about like, how do we all keep ourselves happy when we're not working in person anymore? Because for me, happiness and thriving are not the same thing, right? On any given day, work might be hard for me. And I might actually feel like I'm thriving even though I'm not that happy. That happened to me yesterday. I had a really long day, a lot of really kind of stressful meetings and presentations. My team and I were struggling with an issue. I didn't really feel that happy. It was a hard day, but I did feel that I was thriving. And I think that it's important for us to keep in mind, even now in quarantine, that rewarding work is not always happy. At the same token, we want to tune in with ourselves and ask ourselves if we are feeling that we're thriving. So let me just put up on the screen really quickly here a reminder. And again, for some of you who have been with me before, you've seen these before, but if you haven't seen them before, I offer them now for you to think a little bit about in terms of this question of how do we nurture relationships 
at work when we're not face to face. These are the seven things that we need from our work. And these seven things come from the research that I did with my co-author, Cami Dunaway, in my book, Fit Matters, which I have a copy of here because I'm working on a new program called Love Your Job based on this curriculum. And also from my book, Brave Space Workplace, which just came out in 2019. You can see them on the screen here. The seven things we need from work are to meet our basic needs. That's our financial and non-cash compensation so that we can provide food, shelter, water, safety, security for our families and our people. The second is to contribute, which means to contribute to something bigger than ourselves, to know that what we do matters to someone. The third is we need to be seen. We need to be seen and known. Someone knows our name. They know a little bit about us. We need to connect with other people. This is a basic human need. Maslow had it a little bit wrong in his hierarchy because he put it about midway up his pyramid. But we now know from research that our need for human connection as social beings is as important to us as food, shelter, water, security, and safety. And that means that we bring that need to work. And I'll circle back on this in a minute because it impacts this virtual environment that we're in. The fifth need we have of work is to learn to be better tomorrow than we were yesterday. The sixth is to feel supported, to know that someone has our back, that our team has our back, to know that we can take risks and be supported when we're being brave to take risks. This is how innovation happens at work, how creativity unfolds. And then lastly, we need to make our lives work, which means a variety of things to us. We wanna be able to have time for our hobbies, our families. We need to do caregiving if, if that's our story. We need to be able to take care of our physical self. All of those things have to do with making our lives work. So when we think about these seven needs that we bring to work today, we can see the intersection with the dynamic of working virtually because many of these become much, much harder when we're not in person. How do we be seen? What does that look like? How do we actually connect when this video and phone process is so challenging? I'm noticing in a lot of the systems that I'm working in that our learning, our, our reminder that we as human beings need to learn has kind of um, gone away because we're so busy with our agendas on meetings that we're sort of forgetting to experiment, to be creative, to tend to each other's learning needs. I'm also noticing that people aren't doing as much efforting virtually in feeling supported and in letting each other know that they appreciate the work that they're doing. Someone said to me recently, well, it's not like we don't have the water cooler conversation. We don't have that passing in the hall, good job on that report, or see you at the happy hour tonight. Okay, so we're, we've lost a big volume of that exchange that goes on informally at work, which really impacts these basic needs. Do feel free to weigh in as we continue with any comments to what I'm saying or any reactions that you have or any questions that may be coming up for you in the question uh, box or panel. So given, go back for a second, given these seven things that we need from work, I wanna review just a couple of tools that I think are helpful for how we partner. And I'm, I'm in, in particular, I'm gonna to get to video norms and, and um, ways of operating in just a minute. But I wanna look at sort of some broader constructs first. And one of them is a Brene Brown expression that is, um, that is I think particularly helpful when it comes to connecting virtually and keeping our teams healthy. And that is the metaphor, or excuse me, the acronym of BIG. BIG stands for boundaries, integrity, and generosity. And I'm noticing myself right now in COVID times, reiterating the value of BIG for team health over and over again with clients. So BIG, the B is for boundaries. Boundaries has to do with what's okay and what's not okay. And this is really important in a virtual environment. You guys all know about rules that you have on Zoom calls, et cetera, on a webinar like this. For example, you're all quiet, I, I can't hear you. Um, but usually you might have rules around mute yourself if you're not talking. But you might consider defining boundaries around other dimensions of your virtual connection, such as, um, is it okay to skip a meeting? Can I listen to a recording of it? Um, what, what are the norms around being late? What are the norms around multitasking? 
Those are all boundary kinds of questions. If we're having a meeting, should I also be working on my email? What's okay, what's not okay? I was teaching a workshop with a client this week and three of the participants out of about 20 have young children at home that they're teaching. And they're, they were all around kindergarten age. And one of the things I said at the beginning of the class was, please know that it's really okay with me if your child needs attention from you during this session because our session was four hours long. We were gonna have lots of breaks, but I was aware that young children might need their parents sooner than that. So I said, if they come in into your arms while we're teaching, if they need you to step away for a few minutes to help them get on their Zoom class or whatever, or they just need a hug from mom or dad, that's really okay with me. One of the women um, that was in that class said to me afterwards how grateful she was that I set that boundary about what's okay and what's not okay, because she's felt very much like she sort of had to keep her kids quiet and out of sight on all these Zoom calls for work. And that's hard to do. It's a big stress for those of you with young children at home right now or elderly parents or even pets that you're caring for because you're home now. Um, so what is okay, what is not okay is super important. And I'm not only talking about sound interference, but, um, but you know, in general. So, so think about boundaries. The second is integrity, which is really about values. Doing what I say I'll do, doing what you say, what, you'll do and living into your values. And this has to do with bringing a value-centered approach to our conversations. And I'll give you just a little example of that from my own team. My group is non-co-located. And, and by the way, a little side note is I'm hearing that uh, many teams that have remote workers, that had remote workers previous to COVID, they are loving it right now because the the remote workers are feeling like everybody's experiencing what they feel a lot of the time. And so, so I'm noticing that in my team because one of my remote workers is saying, gosh, I'm actually relieved because now we're all remote and I don't feel behind all the time because you guys had like inside scoop that I didn't have. My team has a high value on collaboration. That's something we talk quite a bit about and I, I try to model it as the leader of the team. And yet sometimes I don't model that through my behavior. And a good example was last week, I ended up setting up one-on-ones with two of my team members um, to talk about a project we were working on. And I had the one-on-ones and on the second one-on-one, one of my team members said to me, hey Mo, why didn't you just get us together as one team to talk about this issue instead of having one-on-ones? Because it seems like you're, you're saying you want collaboration, but yet you're meeting with us separately. And I thought it was a really good example. I hadn't really thought about it. It was just easier for me to kind of schedule a Zoom call with one and schedule a Zoom call with another. And the reality was I could have easily made that a collaborative process and it would have been a lot more efficient. And it started from that value of collaboration, which I had sort of forgotten about in the pace of, of business. The last one that I think is so helpful about big is generosity. Generosity has to do with assuming that people are doing the best they can, giving them the benefit of the doubt. Um, a spirit of generosity allows us to bring empathy more strongly forward in our partnerships. And it also allows us room for self-compassion. I don't know about you all. I'd love to have you weigh in on the chat, but I'm noticing a lot of self-recrimination and a lot of feelings of not enoughness going on right now with all this remote working. People aren't getting the regular feedback that they need to help them know that they're on track with a job. So it's easy to make up like, oh, I'm, I'm failing, I'm missing something, I'm not doing this right. And I think it's helpful to give ourselves some generosity as well as to our teams to say, hey, it's good enough. I believe that you're doing the best you can in some very trying circumstances. So I think the big metaphor and this tool is really a powerful one to think about in terms of how we stay connected, even amidst COVID. Now I mentioned already empathy. And of course, um, some of you that have worked with me in the past have probably heard me wax on about empathy because it's actually my favorite tool in the shed for how we connect. And um, it's very true right now as well. There is nothing in my mind that's more powerful virtually than the practice of empathy for us today. And empathy is not the same thing as sympathy. Sympathy is feeling bad for and empathy is feeling with. It has four steps to it. You can see them here. And the fourth one is the step of mindfulness, 
you'll notice that the, excuse me, not the fourth, the fifth step, you'll notice that uh, the mindfulness step is not the same as problem solving. I think in COVID times, empathy becomes so important because we need to see each other. Remember I talked about that need that we have to be seen in ways that are much harder in a virtual medium. So the first step of empathy, perspective taking, is all about inquiring about, being curious. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Being curious about someone's perspective. How do they see it? Why do they see it that way? And then the second step is staying out of judgment, staying out of judgment, and really just allowing their perspective to be real. And then thirdly, recognizing that emotion that they're feeling that's underpinning that difficulty and then naming the emotion, communicating and connecting to it as an emotion that we ourselves have felt. And one of the things that this brings us to is my belief that during COVID, thank you, Penny, for saying bless you for me, um, is that we really need to pay attention to our emotional landscape and recognizing and communicating emotion with one another through empathy is a really powerful way that we can see each other. I had a client who had a coaching call with me about two weeks ago and we got on the line and um, she started talking about the issue that she wanted to work on. And, and I was, I just was looking at her face on the screen and something seemed a bit off to me. And I asked her to tell me what was going on. And she started to tell me how overwhelmed she was feeling. And um, as I, listen to her, I could see that this was what it was that she needed to talk about on this day, not so much the project that we were engaged with. And so I just asked her, you know, tell me more about what that feels like for you right now. And as she did, I, I was able to connect. I know the feeling of being overwhelmed, not the same as her, but I certainly know that feeling. And I was able to let her know that. I said, I understand. I, I, I know that feeling of overwhelm. It's so hard to know what priorities to pick, et cetera. And just that single act of my being able to hold space for her overwhelm facilitated a lot of forward movement. And I did that by resisting the urge to problem solve and to drive for my agenda for the call, which is something that I think um, sometimes get it, gets in our way of connection virtually, is that we have this hour reserved or this half hour reserved and we're just really like, we've got to get through this agenda. And I think sometimes right now we just need to really see each other. Now, empathy for self is self-compassion. And um, self-compassion is, uh, is it consists really of three parts to it. You can see them listed here. Self-kindness versus self-judgment right? Really treating ourselves like we would a dear friend, you know, talking to ourselves like we would someone we loved, as opposed to the way we sometimes talk to ourselves, like you stupid idiot, or how could you think that was a good idea or whatever. Another part of self-compassion is that it allows us to look at our common humanity versus feeling alone or isolated. And I think this is a really important dimension of self-compassion to think about. Um, in a virtual environment because we tend, we do all feel alone, but ironically, we're not all alone, right? We are, we are all feeling alone apart. <laughs> so recognizing, giving ourselves permission to say, this is a common experience. This is not just me. I'm not actually the only one who's feeling this. It gives me kind of a bridge to connect with others. I'm noticing a comment from Addy, which I really appreciate uh, that it's so much easier to connect about feelings in the office space, um, that it's hard to hold that space for things that are not task-based right now in the virtual space. And I, I agree, Addy. I think that is one of the things that makes right now really hard. And yet part of what I'm hoping to convey to you in this webinar is I think we must create time for these kinds of connection. Because otherwise, it's like we're not injecting lubrication into the joints of our productivity, right? And we're just going to, we're going to grind each other down with stress and overwhelm. And so I think we have to find ways to kind of replace those informal social connections at work with ways we connect virtually, which I'm going to get to. Um, 
So I, I really appreciate what you're saying there. And so the third part of self-compassion is being able to be mindful with what's happening versus over-identifying with what's happening. In other words, being less selfish or less self-focused um, with, with our own experience. All of these dimensions of self-compassion, of course, help us be a better partner for others and in better empathy with others. Now, I used the term earlier of grounded confidence, and I want to move into um, another tool set for you. And, I'm, and I am, by the way, hoping to have plenty of time for questions. Um, so we'll wrap up in a few minutes. But grounded confidence equals rumbling skills plus practice plus curiosity. Let me break that down a little bit. Grounded confidence means that we are kind of in our lane and we're, we're balanced, we're centered. We feel upright and we feel okay. And we get that by rumbling skills, which is knowing how to talk about what's hard, which by the way, sometimes and almost always includes feelings, combined with practice, doing it over and over again so that we become better at it. And then lastly, being genuinely curious about each other. And what I'm noticing in COVID-19 quarantine is that we are, we are not providing enough rigor and mindfulness to both practice and curiosity, which means we're also not rumbling. We're not talking about what's hard enough. And over time, this is going to have a negative effect on our partnerships at work because we're not getting to the important stuff that matters, like feedback, like creativity, like challenging each other. Those are good things in terms of the results that we get. So, so my suggestion for you is that you continue to think about how is it that you're talking about what's hard and are you creating enough time and are you efforting in the right way to practice with others and to be genuinely curious about them. And I have some suggestions about how you do that virtually in just a minute. One of my suggestions is to practice something called engaged feedback. You know, feedback's hard in non-quarantine, right? It's hard to make time for it. It's hard to ask for it. It's hard to give it. And it's hard to get it. Most of us really want feedback, don't we? We want to know how we're doing. But we often hesitate to ask because sometimes we sort of self-protect about it. You know, what if, it's, what if it hurts? What if it's hard to hear? And many of us hesitate to give feedback. Now, the story we often tell ourselves is that we don't want to give feedback because we don't want to hurt someone. But my actual lived experience is that we don't want to give feedback because we don't want to be rejected by someone. I'm going to say that again. The reason we don't give feedback often is that we are concerned and fearful that we will be rejected and disconnected from them. And it may look like, and we may say, oh, we don't want to hurt them. But the reality is we don't want to be hurt. We don't want to be rejected. And so this engaged feedback checklist gives us some mindsets that we might try on in order to be more successful in feedback, even in a virtual way. Now, it's funny because this first one, I know that I'm ready to give feedback when I'm ready to sit next to you rather than across from you. Of course, we're not sitting next to each other right now at all, but this is a metaphor, right? This is around, I'm ready to be in the problem with you rather than judging you from the outside. I'm willing to put the problem in front of us rather than between us or just sliding it towards you, like good luck with this messy pile of doo-doo right? Because when we're in feedback, we want to make sure that we're being in the problem with someone. Like, I'm here with you. I'm giving you this feedback because I care about you. I'm ready to listen, ask questions, and accept that I may not fully understand the issue. I'm ready to acknowledge what you do well instead of just picking apart your mistakes. I'm just going to read these while you look at them on the screen. I recognize your strengths and how you can use them to address your challenges. I can hold you accountable without shaming or blaming. Now, this is a particularly important one in COVID because um, we don't have that limbic connection to know someone's intention behind words. So if I try to hold a team member accountable, this just happened actually with my team where I said to someone, um, oh, the way you did that was different than what I was expecting. I'd like to see it done that differently in this way. If we had been in person, I think she would have gotten my vibe like, hey, no problem. I just think it'd be better. I, I would prefer if we did it this way, the boundary, right? But the what, but because it was done, in this case, it was actually done via email because I think we're using email more and texting more right now because we're not in person. She made up that I was very judgmental of her and that I was very disappointed in the work. 
if we had been in person or even on Zoom, I think she would have gotten my vibe a little bit, but I wasn't disappointed in her. I just wanted to see it done a little bit differently. And, um, and that's important. We need to be able to hold accountability, hold those boundaries without people feeling shamed or blamed, which means I'm open to owning my part. I can generally thank someone for their efforts rather than criticize them for their failings. Can I notice what you're doing well? Can I talk about how resolving these challenges will lead to growth and opportunity? And I can model the vulnerability and openness that I expect to see from you, which is one of my strong tips around how we connect virtually. We walk our talk. We be willing to be vulnerable and open ourselves, even in the virtual environment. And what often gets in the way of us being brave in that way is not our fear. It's our self-protection. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of different interesting ways that we self-protect in the virtual environment. You know, there's probably been, you've, you guys have probably seen a lot of jokes about, you know, um, party on the party on the bottom, professional on the top, right? I'm wearing my, my nice work outfit on the top, but on the bottom I have on my sweatpants. Okay. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about here is the self-protection that's about me defending and protecting my tender heart because I don't want to show up and be seen. And it's often that hesitation, that self-protection that keeps us from being brave. And where I see this showing up on calls, on Zoom calls and on in the quarantine environment is that people aren't asking for what they need and they're not speaking up in the virtual formats, which is harder because you've got everybody on there that you can see visually and it can feel like a really hard thing. You might interrupt someone. How do you get your voice out there? So we self-protect by just being quiet, don't we? And then we only hear from a few voices. So what needs to happen, I think, for us in a virtual environment is that we need to know the emotional landscape of our team so that we can attend to their fears and feelings. And this includes our boss, by the way, or it includes us if we are the boss. This is the fears and the feelings that are going on in our team and in ourselves that are going to interfere with our capacity to connect. So we've got to find some ways to navigate those in a virtual environment. Now, this, there's a lot to look at on this slide, and um, I'll, you'll be getting this slide deck so that you can uh, you know, study it in a bit, bit more detail. I'm going to move my video down a little bit. But this was a little, um, little PDF that my team came up with around some of the ways that we think you can actually be more effective via Zoom or by, via a video platform, whichever one you use, um, in terms of creating those connections. So let's sort of look at these steps one at a time and do feel free to weigh in on the chat if you love one or you have a question of, of someone. So the first one is that you do turn your video on. Now in a webinar format like this, that's not really possible because it's a big group. But in smaller groups, um, it really helps to have the video on. We can see each other, even if you have more than 20 people or whatever that you can fit on your screen, if you have 100 people, go ahead and put everyone on because then you can sort of swipe through and see people there. It also helps to hold accountability. Now, a lot of people are uncomfortable on video. They don't want their face to be seen, but my strong suggestion is that you invite people to please put their video on because it's part of how we get seen. Brene Brown, who's one of my mentors, hosted a team call for all of the Daring Way facilitators in the world um, about two weeks ago. And there were 650 of us on the call. And, you know, to see everybody had to like screen through all these screens. But I really appreciated being able to see my co-facilitators around the world and to see their faces. Now, the other piece about turning the video on is to make sure to look at the video. Look at people on your screen, right? Notice them. That's that second piece where it says, look, try hard not to multitask. Once your eyes track away, everyone's going to know that you're not fully present. So, you know, if I'm down like this and I'm looking at my email, you're going to know, or I'm looking over here at my phone, you know, you're going to know. And so try to be present. Look in your camera. I'm looking at my camera right now. Now I'm looking at my screen. So if I'm really looking at you while you're talking, great. I should look at you on the screen. If I'm looking at my camera like that, that's what I want to do when I'm talking to you. Now, this next tip is um, one that we really try to practice, and it's asking a question 
open up your calls or your meetings with a question. Now, the best questions in our mind are ones that are ambiguous and personal. Okay, so it's not a yes or no question. It's also not how are you? Because how are you in our society has become kind of dumbed down. It's like what you say when you go to Starbucks. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? It doesn't actually invite vulnerability. So I suggest a more personal question. And we actually have, um, I'll show you in a minute, we have a, we've evolved a card deck um, called the Brave Card Deck that has 52 questions that you can ask. And there are things that are nice warm-ups to a team connecting for a meeting. And it could be something, something simple like, what's something you feel good about accomplishing this week? Or what are you finding challenging? Or to what degree do you feel isolated right now? But a question that requires someone to think about themselves and put themselves into the story is really helpful. Now, when you ask a question like that, you need to give a way for people to answer. And, it, and you can have them on mute. That's, a, that's probably the best way, especially with a group of say 20 or less. If it's a bigger group than that, like it is here, I suggest using the chat or the question feature so that you can get some inputs and then react. So I'm gonna test you right now and I'm gonna ask this question and I want you to put something in the chat if you can. My question for you is, what is your biggest worry about the connections that you're missing with your team? right now. What is your biggest worry about some of the connections you might be missing with your team? Worry or fear? And I'd love to see your responses in the chat as we press on. Um, so space is another tip, which is to make sure to give, oh, a good reminder, Ad is reminding me, make sure the blue drop down says to um, panel and attendees so that we can all see your your responses. Thank you. Um, so giving space to everyone means that you actually allow people um, to show up by unmuting and having a, 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 a comment, right? And pausing, giving people a minute to, you know, to think about what they might want to say. Um, the next one in the center there is to be brave, to be vulnerable, to show empathy, to be as present as you can, and to show up with intention. This is where walking your talk really matters. I'm gonna, oh, I love the responses that are coming in. Thank you. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna look at them and address them in just a minute. Um, and then another tip is to schedule your next meeting on the meeting that you're having so that everyone knows and sees the team agreeing to meet again. And by the way, you can have your team meet just for something light. Let's have a breakfast, breakfast coffee. Right, let's just check in on how we're doing this week. It doesn't always have to have a full agenda and it also doesn't always need to be an hour long, okay? Use the tools in Zoom or in whichever feature you use, like the breakout rooms are great to give people a chance to talk in a small group. People are much more willing to do it in a small group than in a large group, okay? Review that it's okay and not okay, what, what is okay and what's not okay in terms of boundaries so they know how to show up. So those are just a few of our tips. Now let's look at how you did answering my question. I love this. So people worry about slacking off or that they won't be seen as showing up fully. Worrying that my team might lose the team mentality. I love that. Not having each other's back because they can't be seen or heard throughout the day. I hear that so often, both of those actually, that people are worried that they're slacking off. And so if that's the case, then what you want to work on is making sure that everybody gets a way to talk about what they're working on to talk about what's hard about it and how it's engaging them. Because that's how you get to show up. And when you're in person, that's much more visible because you might be swinging by, oh, you're working on the catalog or you're doing that spreadsheet. But we need to create some space for that in our team meetings so that nobody has to worry that they're not doing enough. Um, and I think having each other's back is super important. How are we going to say what we need? And this is something I think we have to really turn the dial up in our virtual environment which is the way we have each other's back is that we let people know what we need. So my team, for example, recently said to me, they, 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 together they agreed, not, not without me, but on a call that we were on together, they really wanted us to do better with our commitments to timelines. And one of the people on the team said, I really would like us to only commit to timelines that we think are realistic because we had been missing some deadlines. 
And I really like that suggestion. I have trouble with it because I sometimes let my own timeline slip, but super helpful. Now, I wanna comment on something right now before I look at the rest of these because these are so great. And that is that Addie just came back on video. And I can tell the difference in my energy when she's on video because I can see what she's doing. She's taking some water, she's, I can see her head nodding. It makes a huge difference. So make sure when you can, you can use the phone sometimes, but if you're in a team meeting, try to get your folks to turn on their video so that you can really look at each other because it, it is an energetic lift. Um, email is so cold. I worry that sometimes email responses come across harsher. I love that. And let me just say, you're right. Email conveys no emotional resonance. It's a one dimensional mechanism of communication. So when we don't know what the emotional resonance is in email, we just make it up. We make up that people are angry. We make up that they're disappointed. So my suggestion is don't convey feedback in email. Don't have hard conversations in email, right? It's, it's not the right form for that. What email is great for is tactical messaging, can we have a meeting at four? Please review this document on Google Sheets. It's really not that good for interpersonal communication. I love this one, um, giving space. I'm a talker and a fast processor, so having a hard time pausing and giving other people space, I think that's really common, especially in a learning environment. And, and a, a tiny tip that I sometimes practice is I say to myself, okay, Mo, you asked a question, now count to 10 and just listen. And if nobody says anything after I really count to 10 and I, I make myself go one and two, <laughs> like I do it that slow, um, because almost always somebody's going to say something. Many people just aren't saying anything because somebody else is doing all the talking. So I love that idea of being mindful of sharing airtime um, and then losing social and emotional connection. Whoops, I lost my slide here. I think that's a I get that. And I think one of the ways we counteract that is by asking, asking questions. Um, good job. You responded. Oh, there's a couple more that I missed here. Um, yeah. Don't, don't enjoy chat and, um, or video if I'm having a tough day. Um, I, I think that that's really real. Um, you know, we don't have that lack of small talk if we're feeling, so here's the thing, when we're having a hard day, it's really easy to just stay in the privacy of our hard day when we're not in person. Whereas if we're down the hall from each other, somebody might notice that we're having a hard day. And I think this is where learning how to be more vulnerable really matters. Being able to reach out to someone and say on my team, hey, I'm having a hard day. I'm struggling with this project. Could you take a look at it with me? Or could we just pop on and get 10 minutes because I'm kind of stuck? Or I just feel isolated. I've been working heads down on this thing for three days. Could we have a virtual coffee? You know, those kinds of requests are vulnerable, but they will, they will pay off in the emotional connection and energy that you get. Um, yeah, more to say, more in processing and email is so, so quipped. Yeah, I agree with that comment. Whoops, let me see. There's another one below here. Um, yeah. Uh, people's feelings. Um, it's harder to, it's harder to have some of that interaction, like the high fives and those kinds of things that, that are, um, that are happening virtually. Although I am seeing some teams do some funny things, like just going like this, like, Hey, high five, you know, we did it. Um, or if someone's struggling, someone, uh, a client of mine had someone who had a death recently and kind of just everybody just sort of went like this. There's the whole, you know, how, um, often people that are hard of hearing communicate applause, like that can be a powerful thing. We did that on the call I mentioned with Brene. Someone says, hey, I kicked it. I made this sale. Cool. Let's give a little applause so that people can feel seen about that. This last comment from Maddie about um, it's going to be awkward, you know, because people are so anxious still about COVID. And I do think that's something that we're feeling. Um, and yeah, and, and I think we're just going to have to walk our way through it because we have paradoxes right now. We have um, here in Oregon, for example, we have very low COVID rates, but we know the virus hasn't gone. So the fear is not gone. So we have this tension of, we know we can open back up, but we want to do so safely. And we may still have anxiety about that. Um, so I think that that's real. 
Now, here's, um, as we move into just some open space for questions, here's one of my favorite um, Brene Brown quotes, which is that shame loves perfectionists. It's so easy to keep us quiet. And for me, this is one of the biggest ways that we try to stay connected um, virtually is that we, we manage our own perfectionism because perfectionism keeps us quiet and it keeps us isolated. And by perfectionism, I mean all the stories we're telling ourselves about how we should connect. For example, should I have that project team meeting if the project's not on schedule? Should I reach out and tell someone what I need or will I look weak? We, we want to manage that perfectionism because we know that the hustling to do it all just perfectly right now is not actually what's the most helpful for us. What's the most helpful for us is to just show up as we are, to be generous of spirit that we're doing the best we can and to not get bogged down um, in, in the rest of it. So I'm going to stop sharing right now because I want to give a little bit of time in our remaining time for any questions that people may have. You could put them in the chat or you could put them in the question um, feature as well. Um, I have an idea for us, Mo. Yeah. If people want to practice all the things you've been saying about being brave, you don't have to be on video, but if you use the little hand raising feature, I can allow you to talk and then we can hear your voice. Awesome. Um, and maybe that will, you know, increase our levels, but we have to see who's, who's interested in that. Cause we've also gotten used to logging on to webinars and just being able to sit and, you know, multitask or be distracted. Um, we don't have to put ourselves on the spot. So if anyone wants to talk to Mo voice to voice, raise your hand and I'll allow you to talk. Awesome. Thanks, Addie. And also, of course, the chat and Q&A are open. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So we got chat, we got Q and A. You can raise your hand, and you can um, you can have get Addie's attention. And so this is a genuine invitation. We have just under ten minutes to to kind of talk about any other needs you might have about how we connect when we're not face to face. Um, and while we're waiting for you to get brave and ask what you want, um, here's what I'm really feeling. Um, I've been doing some studying of other pandemics, and um, in particular the 1918 pandemic, which did affect this region. If you've ever been out to Fort Rock, there's a little cemetery out there and it's more than half of those graves are actually from the 1918 epidemic, which is really scary and sad. Um, but what I, what I noticed in, what I'm noticing in studying the 1918 epidemic is that people can't stand disconnection. They, in that pandemic, part of why it was so hard, um, they, is that people couldn't stand to be apart. Now, back then, they didn't have Zoom. They didn't have um, phones in most cases. So they were really isolated when they were in quarantine, and they couldn't take it. They couldn't take it. And so they broke quarantine, which resulted then in more, you know, more spikes of the virus. And so I think what's, what we're noticing right now is, I, like, I actually don't think we're meant to be apart. Now, we do have this technology, though, that allows us to try to connect and still manage the, the viral load issues a little bit better, but we've got to learn how to use the technology for real connection, not just for task accomplishment. So that's a great reminder, Mo. Penny, we, um, we have you on. Do you want to go ahead? Hey there. So Hi. I just wanted to kind of elaborate on what Karen has mentioned about keeping your team so encouraged, energized, how to celebrate accomplishments. Um, do you have any recommendations on things that we can do to try to get full team engagement versus just individualized engagement of those things? Mm, I love that question, Penny. Thank you for that. So kind of the, in case you didn't hear, the, the question is about how do I keep my team engaged and how do I celebrate accomplishments and, you know, moving beyond just kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Definitely. I've been seeing some really fun things for people to do. So one idea is just to take other social conventions like meals, um, coffee, happy hours, and move them into your meeting formats, right? And I'm seeing teams get really creative with some of that stuff in ways that sound really hokey and silly, but they actually enliven the energy. So for example, if there's a celebration, have somebody have balloons behind them, right? Have, have a cake. You know, if you're the leader of a team and you have a big accomplishment, maybe send everybody cupcakes, 
you know, there's delivery services here and then so that everybody gets cupcakes that day and you get to eat them together, you know, or do a social event. Like, um, do you guys remember, you probably, most of you on the call are too young, but back when I was little, we used to do these progressive dinners, you know, when I was a teenager and a young person, my parents would do in their neighborhood, like every, my parents would do the appetizer and the people next door would do the, the main meal. Well, progressive dinners are coming back as a way to connect a team socially where, um, you know, Addie's going to be preparing um, sandwiches and Matt is going to do pizza. We're all going to take our, our lunch time together and, and talk about kind of what we cooked or what we're serving. I think there's also some functions um, that we can do virtually on Zoom that use other technologies where you can draw things like you can use the whiteboard on Zoom. You can also have, I think it's called Funtopia, but I'll, I'll find the link for you and send it in the notes. There's an app where you can have your slides be interactive. So you could put something up on like, what do people think about this decision and have people actually on their screen, they can go and respond to that. Of course, you can use polls and other word clouds and things through Zoom itself. Um, and then lastly, I would say that one other thing I've noticed people doing with teams to stay connected is giving the team a pre-assignment so that when they come back together for that interaction or that celebration, everybody knows what their role is vis-a-vis -vis the assignment. So it might be, let's all speak to what we've accomplished in the last 30 days or what you've accomplished. You know, we're going to have a chance for everybody to talk about what, what they've accomplished or um, to have people prepare a summary of what they're needing for the next month. So kind of giving a little bit of structure for people so that when you come together, it's not just like a blank slate, let's let this meeting unfold. It's a little bit more structured around, hey, we're going to notice our accomplishments. We're going to celebrate them together. Uh, and of course, that also means calling out as a leader, calling out wins when you see them. You know, good job, Maddie. Good job, Celeste, um, for X, Y, Z. Remember, good job just by itself is not that useful. What we want to do is say, good job, Penny. I really appreciated the way you opened up that meeting last week with the client because it was open, safe, and all the data was in one place, right? Mm -hmm. I want to be specific with my compliments so that people understand what we're celebrating and what we did well. I don't know if that ha ha helps Penny, but those are a couple of ideas. Thanks for the good question. Anything else top of mind or any other comments people wanna offer? I have a colleague, um, I have a couple of colleagues who are in the experiential education space. So folks from my, my adventure route background, and they're doing some really fun things with um, virtual team building experiences. Um, and, and, you know, doing things like, like having people um, build a structure and then show it on their Zoom, you know, sort of just creative pieces like that that are kind of fun. A question came up, um, about the card deck, yes, and I, I should have had a, a set here with me. Our little card deck is called the Brave Card Deck. They're available on my website, and you can also just reach out um, to me directly, and I can send you the link to, to buy them. Um, and I'm happy to send you a free copy of them. Um, in fact, I'll show you. Well, I don't, I don't actually have what they look like here, but um, I have a PDF of them that I'm happy to send out for free, and the card deck, I think, costs $21, and you can buy it on our website. And it's just like a card deck, but it has these 52 questions, that some of which are uh, you know, kind of provocative. They're, they're written specifically to a work context, um, although they can certainly be used for, um, for family and connecting socially as well. Thank you awesome. so much, Mo. I think we're at, at the end of our time. We are. We are. Thank you, Addie. Uh, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. I just want to let everyone know that we will be sending out an email um, follow-up as we usually do, um, and we'll have the deck from today and uh, a link to the cards from Mo and, um, uh, and any other comments um, that we have for you will be sent out. Oh, Cindy says, thanks, Mo. Hi, awesome. Cindy. <laughs> We're doing, um, uh, Cindy's going to do another expert series for us actually in June. So you guys don't miss out on that. It's going to be great. Awesome. Well, thanks for doing all these, Addie. And um, keep me posted, anybody who's still on the call around what else you're noticing that helps to connect. Um, it's hard, but it's important. That's extra hard work now. It already was hard. And now it's just right. harder. Yeah. More draining. Mm. 
You know, actually, Addie, that's something that's important to think about. I'll put this in the notes too. We got to put our own oxygen mask on first. And I didn't even say that, oh, right? That's right. One way we can really care for each other is just to take care of ourselves and make sure that you're doing all the basics, you know, sleeping, exercising, hydrating. Um, and that helps to feel fortified to connect with people the way we need to across Zoom. That's interesting though, Mo, because those things tend, for me anyway, I don't know if anybody else feels this way, but those self-care things go down when you're just at home. I, my morning routine, I don't have one anymore, you know? Yeah, you're right. Cause it's I saw it. work have gotten really thin. Yeah. I saw something recently that said, you have a right to clean sheets. Don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take care of those little things. Absolutely. Yeah. They matter. Uh, thanks everyone. You can, um, Mo, if you want to just hang around for a minute. Okay, perfect. We'll do everyone else. Thank you for coming. Thanks everybody.